Okay. So, I mean, basically, uh, the idea behind this design session was to talk more about what we had talked about in the Zen community call with respect to um, open sourcing the bare flank work that we're doing uh, into the uh, Zen project in one way or another, and kind of getting a feel for what people's preferences were um, and uh, how you'd like to see it done. Did uh, that go through? I can hear you. I mean, so I mean, basically, I, I was um, I was just saying that the idea behind um, this design session was to discuss more about how we would go about open sourcing the bare flank uh, Zen. Uh, PVH work that we've been doing um, back into the Zen project. Oh yeah, um, so we, we, we heard that. I heard that. So uh, okay, yeah, I heard uh, that as well. All right, awesome. So I mean, uh, when we talked to, during the Zen community call, there were um, essentially um, two different options. And I probably could go through just a real quick right, can we, um, um, update. Uh, can, can we have someone to uh, take some notes? I guess I, I, I can I can volunteer at, at a limit how much I can. Uh, yeah, each there. of the design sessions wants someone nominated as scribe, and um, probably best to use the shared notes um, folder. So it's it's on the left hand side, just under public chat. Yeah, but it shouldn't be someone who's heavily involved in the discussion because it's it's just hard to to take notes and discuss at the same time. Yeah, is there who can actually hear the audio? Um, to take the notes. Hey, Brendan, can you do that quick for us? Sure. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I probably should start by just doing a quick refresh as to what we've done um, up to this point uh, for those who aren't on the community calls. Um, but basically, uh, under the bare flank project, we have re-implemented the majority of the Zen PVH uh, hypercall interface using the bare flank hypervisor instead of the, the Zen hypervisor. Um, and we did that because uh, we essentially needed to sort of implement a different hypervisor design um, while still wanting to kind of you know, support our existing Zen virtual machines that we use for OpenXT and other um, projects and um, really some of the big things that we tried to accomplish as part of the project was um, at a high level was removing the need for Zen to have a scheduler or power management code and letting um, sort of like Dom Zero handle that for us. Um, another goal that we had in mind was a Windows Dom Zero instead of a Linux Dom Zero. And uh, we also um, wanted the ability to start and stop the hypervisor without having to reboot the computer. Um, since we're doing a lot of heavy development, constantly having to reboot the computer can be um, something that really slows you down quite a bit. And um, I mean, I kind of above and beyond that, I think those are probably the really big um, things that we we're trying to do. I mean, in the end, the Windows DOM zero part of it is the thing that we cared uh, the most about above and beyond the schedule and power management stuff. And that was for device support. So we really didn't want uh, Linux running um, due to the fact that it, for some devices that we're trying to support, device support just isn't that great. Uh, and so we, we you know, basically took the bare flank SDK um, and implemented a prototype uh, that allows us to essentially, you know, execute Zen virtual machines and they think they're running in Zen. Um, and so when we finish this kind of work, uh, we, you know, thought to ourselves, okay, how exactly do we want to go about sort of upstreaming this? The, um, you know, one idea is that we could, you know, just put it into our own project and, and kind of maintain it from there. Um, but I, you know, we were talking, you know, with the team and, and thought that maybe it actually would make sense to kind of donate it to the Zen project instead in some way, um, whether it be 
through some sort of uh, you know sort of like sub project within Zen or work over time to actually sort of like upstream these you know changes into the Zen hypervisor itself uh, and not use bare flank at all. So and we're kind of amenable to both um, approaches and you know and if this isn't code that um, the project's interested in, then we could always obviously do it ourselves. But um, we think it'd be a, a benefit to the Zen project, um, you know, kind of moving forward. Thoughts? From, from a uh, point of view with a Zen project hat on, um, having some of this contributed upstream would be lovely. Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I don't have a strong, you know, um, I don't care much about running under Windows, but it would be really great to be able to have people boot just a normal Linux system and say, you know, uh, in Smod Zen, and then like, bam, now you're running Zen, rather than, or, and then unload Zen and re reload a new Zen, um, rather than uh, having to reboot after you install. Uh, so making it so the Zen knows how to do that under Windows, um, would be obviously would make it a lot easier for someone else to, to make that same thing possible under 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 Linux. Um, I don't have it. So at the moment, you have is it true that you have a prototype that can? Does a prototype um, is is a prototype of a Windows module? So you, you boot Windows normally and then um, put this underneath the Windows, or or is it first booted and then boots Windows on top? We, we support both. So um, okay. if you're using PCI pass through at the moment, you have to boot it first only because of the way we set up sort of like a PCI back kind of similar way Zen does. That's not a that we could actually remove that um, the need for that. And while still supporting PCI pass through, um, we just haven't put the glue logic in to be able to have that sort of PCI back reserve a driver and then allow us to move it later. Um, okay. But if you don't use PCI pass through, then yeah, it's a, essentially a Windows driver that loads up the hypervisor, right. and then from there we start like a uh, our a virtual machine that's just a, a, a small little Linux VM mm -hmm. that uh, sort of acts like Dom Zero in a sense, where it starts up uh, Zen Store and it runs Excel and is created, you know, is able to create virtual machines as needed, um, and then but those virtual machines are sort of like attached to uh, executables running inside Windows that are dummy applications. All they do is they're there to uh, be blamed for the time that uh, is being executed to actually execute the virtual machine. So it doesn't have any data in it, doesn't do anything other than just when it is executed by Windows, it tells the hypervisor to, to run a VM. OK. So, I mean, how much of the code that in this prototype is is upstream Zen code versus how much of it is code that you've, you've written, and, and, and how much how much would have to be rewritten or changed for the upstream Zen code to make this work? All of the code we wrote ourselves. Um, I mean, okay. obviously, we used uh, you know the Zen source code as a um, sort of a reference when needed, but okay. it's all brand new code that we wrote. Oh, wow. um, so, and it would probably all need to be rewritten to some degree because we write, I mean, the bare flank hypervisor is written in C++ and so we would have to port, you know, what we did to, to the Zen project itself. Um, we didn't use Zen and try to like manipulate it into this form. We, we started with the bare flank SDK. I see. Um, okay. But that being said, you know, it, a lot of, some of the stuff that we wrote, Zen already has. So there's, you know, there's obviously some logic that would need to be added to, you know, Zen um, to do things like, for example, the, you know, the, the sort of rootkit effect, <laughs> um, you know, it because unlike uh, KVM, which is just a module that loads and then from there runs guest virtual machines, uh, Bear Flank and, you know, the other, you know, projects that it has, they all, when run in that sort of late launch approach, they all basically you know, VMX rootkit the, the host operating system so that it it's now running underneath the virtual machine, uh, which allows us to control the virtual machine the same way that we would, or sorry, like sort of like DOM zero, the same way, you know, Zen would, but does it at a late launch instead of before the OS boots. And uh, I don't think Zen has that today. So that's something that we would have to, you know, sort of implement um, to be able to get the Zen hypervisor up and running. And once we had that, then there would have to be some ABI changes to support additional hyper calls that Zen doesn't have today that 
would allow us to say, for example, tell the hypervisor to run a virtual machine because it won't be able to do that on its own since it won't have a schedule or any power management code. So to your earlier point, Zen at the moment has absolutely none of the rootkit logic in it. Um, I know that Bromium does, uh, so there might be uh, a bit of a reference implementation in their public um, source posting. I, I haven't looked at it. I don't know uh, what's there and if it's something we'd consider reusing. Yeah, I mean, the, the rootkit logic isn't that complicated. It's pretty much identical across all projects that do it. I mean, there's our project. There's also SimpleVisor and Hyper Platform. They all kind of do something similar. Um, and then, it, you know, obviously all of those projects are based off of uh, more, which we wrote a number of years ago and which was originally based off of the, the VMX rootkit uh, that was written by Sean Embleton, Embleton back in like 2007 or something like that, very long time ago. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, you know, it tosses DOM zero into a, into a VM in our particular case. Everything is PVH, so there is no PV that includes DOM zero. Um, and even when you're running like sort of the Linux mode, um, and uh, at the moment there's no HVM, but we're working to add that this year as well as, or sorry, uh, this next coming year as well as nested virtualization for Hyper V. Okay. And it, uh, yeah, I mean, and it is designed so that. Um, it, we try to get as much performance as we can with that architecture. So one big difference is that DOM zero, we worked very hard to ensure that external interrupts were not enabled for that particular VM. So if an interrupt occurs while DOM zero is actually executing, then uh, it's not trapped to the hypervisor, which has a pretty substantial improvement on performance uh, compared to trying to drop on essentially every single interrupt that would fire in the box, um, which is something we tried to avoid at all costs. Um, and so far, we've succeeded in doing that, including with uh, PCI Passer. So it means that the physical local IP is managed by DOM0, I guess, and not Zen? The physical APIC is managed by DOM0, yes. We can obviously intercept that if we need to, but at the moment, we haven't had a need to do that. I mean, is there any device that's managed by Zen when you use that model, or everything is managed by Dom Zero? There are there any devices that are managed? Um, I mean, obviously, the well, no, I mean, so there is, yeah. I guess, but mm -hmm. um, and obviously, the pass through devices would be to the guest VMs, but pretty much all of them are are in the root or pass through to DOM zero. So you basically allow DOM zero to, for example, configure the MSI of the devices directly, I guess. There's no interception there. Uh, for the ones that it's managing, for the pass through, we intercept the MSI's mm -hmm. uh, programming. But... but not for DOM zero. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be slightly different from what we do on uh, PBH DOM0 on Zen at the moment, where we intercept uh, all of those, like we would do for pass-through to untrusted devices. Yeah, that's. I mean, we probably should do that for a security in a security scenario. Um, the default the configuration just doesn't right now. Um, I mean, we would it, if we were add logic like that, which wouldn't be that big a deal. It would be there to simply ensure that the configuration was valid, not necessarily um, to reconfigure anything. We'd still let DOM zero kind of decide oh, what okay. it wants. So you would just like proxy the right uh, to the PCI config space, I guess. Yeah, right. yeah. Just be there as a sanity check to make sure that DOM zero wasn't misbehaving. So I guess that's the, uh, you know, so I mean, I, um, I mean, be, the ability to fire up the hypervisor in this mode, um, one of the big benefits that we've seen right off the bat is the sort of performance and battery life on more like mobile machines has been fantastic, um, near native, frankly. 
And uh, that was one of the driving reasons for that design architecture is to try to keep the amount of, uh, of exits as small as possible um, with some of the big ones being this uh, sort of external interrupt issue. And then in addition, letting the operating system that was built for the device manage the, the device with respect to scheduling and power management. And because, you know, some devices have some very bizarre behavior there. A good example is I have, uh, you know, a, a Dell laptop with a, a Core i9, and there's some pretty aggressive scheduling that's done in power management logic to keep that that chip from overheating and going into, you know, thermal, thermal management on Windows. Um, something that even like Linux still struggles with to some degree, um, although the latest kernel seem to be getting better. Uh, and, yeah, I can confirm my laptop's currently suffering from that. I need to update <laughs> Linux. Yeah, when I first got this, it wasn't until 5.4 that it was starting to get somewhat better. It's still not like Windows still can do about three hours more than what Linux can do. But um, it's yeah, it's not great. And so, you know, Zen managing all that isn't going to be all that fantastic. Um, it would be I would think it'd be a pretty big undertaking for Zen to to build power management logic that was suitable for any any device that was out there, including everything from a, a mobile tablet all the way up to a server. And so in in this model, we we don't do that. We let you know the operating system that was originally designed for that bot, that machine that has the best power management likely uh, that you could get to to do all that work um, instead. Um, and another benefit that we've experienced on OpenXT is that uh, the Zen scheduler and the DOM zero scheduler can sometimes conflict with each other. And one of the better examples of that that we used to run into a lot um, is with audio where there's a very specific sort of like real-time requirement to be able to get data into the uh, you know audio card and uh, sometimes when the system starts getting bogged down pretty heavy audio data coming from say like a, an hvm and then trying to be transitioned into the uh, into dom zero which might require you know four or five different world switches just to be able to pull off the the transaction um that application that's running inside Dom Zero's user space, it still needs to be scheduled just the same as anything else. And the con the conflict between what Zen's trying to do with getting whatever virtual machine scheduled, and then with Dom Zero trying to do its scheduling, can be somewhat problematic because it's hard for um, the system to know that there's something that needs to be executed right away. By removing that and having just one scheduler that maintains all that logic, um, it's it has a lot more contextual information to know. That hey, I've got to do something like right now because I'm I'm running out of time, and uh, you know, so you can get somewhat you know better performance there as well. Right. Well, at least the scheduler has more information about that particular. It has the the DOM the the, the DOM zero the scheduler for DOM zero processes knows that about DOM zero processes, but doesn't know anything about the the, the VMs. But yeah, that's certainly better. Um, was yeah. that kind of curiosity? Was that with the credit one scheduler or with the credit two scheduler? The performance difference that we saw, or yeah. Uh, yeah, I you know honestly I don't I don't know. It's whatever default um, Zen comes with. Well, that that switch um, was it four thirteen that that switch handy? Four twelve, one of those. I um, think that it probably was that one at the time. Say again. Uh, I think it was credit one at the time. Right. Okay. I mean, so I mean, credit one. So. Credit two was designed to have slightly better, um, um, like like w w when I was designing credit two, I actually had sound running in a VM and I was testing it under under load. I haven't tested it in a long time, so it may still be terrible, um, but it might actually be better. Yeah, we have to play with it. I mean, the, our audio logics changed pretty dramatically in OpenXT over the years, so um, right. and it was working actually originally. It's just if you started to get things bogged down, that's when you yeah. start to have some issues. Of course, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so I mean, that, those are some of the driver reasons for why we went down that path. And you know, so far, it, like I said, it's worked out pretty well. Um, the uh, but ultimately, we think that you know, kind of like trying to find a way to get this into your guys' project might be the better path long term, um, mainly just because 
you know, it, I, I, we'd rather not maintain our own implementation of Zen alongside whatever it is you guys are doing as well. Uh, the other side of this is that I think there's a uh, driving need for, uh, you know, sort of like a revisit on the Zen ABI in general. Um, as we did this implementation, we and we've actually I think we we provided some of the details, although we, it's been probably about a year since we've updated it um, as to what hyper calls are actually being made. There's a fair amount of Zen stuff that's done that's uh, that's just not necessary for PVH and HVM um, that would probably simplify the PVH HVM architecture in general. Um, and so it might be worth at some point, you know, also having a longer you know discussion about the ABI in general for PVH and HVM to see if there's improvements that we can make to uh, to make it a little bit more simple and a little bit more optimal for those environments. So does anybody have a particular preference as to how um, you'd like to see us upstream this work? Would you prefer to see a sub project or would you prefer to see us actually uh, upstream this into the into, into the project itself, the mainline project? Personally, I think a sub project is overkill. Um, we're, uh, we're looking at two or three large areas of work, but all fairly self contained in one part of the hypervisor or another. Um, I, I don't think the overhead of a separate sub project is is going to be useful here. I think I would agree with that also. Yeah, so I mean, I think, um, it, it, as Annie said, I mean, it seems like basically um, using the same code that you already have as far as to, to, to do the, you know, um, to, to, to do the, the blue pill thing. Um, and then just hooking in some, somewhere else into the, um, into the Zen boot path um, should be should be pretty self-contained. It would be it would, it would make um yeah it, it, would, it would have a lot of benefits to both of our projects. You guys wouldn't have to maintain a full hypervisor, and um, you know we would have a lot of the features that uh, that you know might be kind of cool. So the scheduling stuff, the, the Zen scheduler is quite. Um, I, I mean, it's probably what else layer off as well. So you know, this, we already have. Four, four or five different um, schedulers inside of there, so it, it seems like it shouldn't be terribly difficult to make it possible to have a you know an external scheduler um, where uh, you know where you hook off of some other processes, so like the, the DOM zeros scheduler rather than running that itself. Ultimately, for scheduling like that, what you will need is um, uh, is to execute a vCPU in the context of a hypercall from DOM zero. So you'll set, you'll have uh, a hypercall that says run this CPU. Uh, that is quite different to what we've got at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how well it would um, integrate easily. You probably need the concept of um, a vCPU tied to the current vCPU. So you, you've got one vCPU does hypercall, hypercall points to another CPU. We schedule that other CPU and schedule back uh, on exit because ultimately, from Dom Zero's point of view, it needs to look like a hypercall and, uh, and ex, uh, one single system call to the hypervisor. That's exactly how Bear Flank works today. There's you know, there's a, what we call that sort of like, um, you know, root vCPUs. They are they are created for one for every single physical CPU that's on there, including threading. And um, they're not optional, meaning they have to be created. And the sort of like DOM zero, um, you know, OS runs, you know, with those in those sort of like root vCPUs. And they act very differently compared to all the other vCPUs that are on the box. And then it will, <clears throat> yeah, it'll basically go and create a sort of virtual machine 
and tell the hypervisor how you know would like to see it you know configured and created and similar to what Zen does today. Um, and then from there, uh, it and that's all done on a driver um, so that we can you know, reserve non-pageable memory and we can you know donate that to the guest. Um, and then from there, this sort of application is run and it is really all it does is it just VM calls up to the hypervisor to say, hey, run me. Um, and it gives it a, you know, so like a DOM ID and, or sorry, a vCPU ID. Um, and what happens is, is that the hypervisor goes and schedules that vCPU to run. And when, and when an exit occurs, and there could be different reasons, usually the, the one that happens the most is an external yeah. interruptible fire. We return back to that sort of root vCPU. And there's obviously nothing stopping uh, at the moment um, from sort of creating that sort of uh, uh, G node style architecture where you could have a virtual machine that creates more virtual machines, that creates more virtual machines if you wanted. And you, you know, sort of capability based. So it keeps dissecting that's its actually, resources. That's actually how it works now, too. Um, yeah. There's really only one. Uh, Sort of management VM created from Windows, and then that looks like DOM zero uh, from a Zen um, interface perspective. And that's what hosts Excel, and then further VMs are created by Excel running from that VM. It's like a tree structure. Yep. So I mean I, I guess the uh, uh, I guess the the answer is that we'd like to see this moved into the uh, hypervisor itself. So um, which is fine. So I guess the first you know, sort of area for us to probably play in to start would be to, to get the rootkit portion working, only because that'll make dev on the rest of it a lot faster and easier. And then once that's done, then we can start working on. Uh, the extra hyper calls that are needed to fire up a virtual machine and run it from the DOM zero perspective instead of uh, from Zen's point of view. And then, you know, kind of just plumb the rest. The, uh, when, when it does come time to sort of add these additional ABI stuff, how do we want that to be done? Um, you know, I know changing ABIs can be a, a pretty complicated thing. So, I mean, you just need to add new hypercalls, or you need to modify the existing ones to do something slightly different. We don't need to modify any. Um, oh. We certainly like to change some to clean up the interface, but that's that's a, a secondary task. We need to add some. If you need to add some, it's pretty non-controversial. You just add the hypercalls, and that's fine. Extensions are fine. Yeah, we add hypercalls all the time. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, on the on the subject of uh, ABIs, um, I know this is something we have discussed before uh, and will continue to discuss. Uh, currently, we're looking at two major, or uh, two separate but major um, ABI changes. Uh, one of which is uh, to make the tools ABI stable, so we can do more sensible updating. Uh, of software at the moment uh, whenever you install a new version of Zen uh, and indeed the user space libraries in DOM0 you can no longer manage the VMs until you reboot and this is a big problem uh, for a lot of uh, downstreams um, so that's one area we're looking into but that's fairly well constrained to the tool stack and um, and the DOMCUTL, SYSCUTL uh, style interfaces. The other major area we're looking at is uh, the general HVM ABI. Uh, the history there is the large amounts of what we have in HVM at the moment was taken by um, starting with the PV ABI and hitting it until it worked. Um, this is not a great design. It has a number of problems. 
most critically uh, at the moment it is still virtual address based which means we cannot use any of the encrypted vm uh, support that's starting to come along in hardware so um, i realize i am distinctly behind in my uh, initial plan to at least try and uh, describe some of the problems and send them for um, discussion on the mailing list but we uh, we, 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 so we, we definitely need to come up with a new ABI to support uh, encrypted uh, virtual machines as that is a break in the ABI or uh, a new V2 ABI. We might as well get everything else correct whilst we're doing it. Uh, so there will be there will be long discussions over how and what we do to change it. And it, it might be that we just have a brand new type of VM, call it V2 or something. That might be the best way of going about it. But it would, what we want to, what we would like to do is, um, is identify all the areas we want to change and see what is the best way of going about making that change. Okay, so I mean, from our point of view, then if we can just add the hyper calls as needed, then that's not that big a deal. Um, and then when it comes time to maybe do a, a cleanup of that stuff, um, we can take a look at the, some of the stuff that we did and, and help, you know, with that effort because we've learned a lot in the process of implementing it, and a lot of the things that are either not necessary or could have been implemented in a way that would have made things a little bit more performant, a little bit easier on the hypervisor um, instead of you know, the way it is now. The, the way it is now is not an example to copy. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think that pretty much concludes uh, this talk. The, I mean, for us, the next step is would be to start working on actually, you know, making these changes and getting them pushed upstream. The um, and so I'll obviously work with you guys over Zendevel to do that. Um, that that type of work won't, probably won't start until about next year. Um, we've got some things that we've got to get done this year uh, between now and then. And uh, internally, we still have to figure out exactly timing wise. You know, we are moving very quickly with the stuff we're doing. So there might be continued effort to finish up what we're doing on our end and then start to upstream or, you know, do do this right off the bat. I don't know. We have to have those conversations internally. So when exactly these these changes would make it to the project um, in next year is is up in the air. But uh, that would be our goal is to start uh, working with you guys uh, then to start doing this. It would probably be useful as a first step to um, do a um, an email to Zendevel uh, covering the vague areas. Um, possibly in slightly more detail than this. So, for example, um, do you want a build of the high? Should we make a, a third build of the hypervisor that is the, um, the that has uh, the scheduler taken out, for example? Or do we want? Because the thing is, this is this is quite a lot different to how Zen currently works, um, and it might be worth having a dedicated kconfig base. Uh, that, for example, has all of Zen's boot path taken out, or most of the boot path, because that won't be relevant for uh, a lot of the setup proposed here. Um, so that might be the best way of having something that's not a fully fledged hypervisor. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I don't know. The boot path probably would still be useful. Um, you know, we we obviously support this sort of type two late launch. I mean, type two is the wrong word, but this sort of late launch approach. But we also very much use the, the early boot. And in fact, in, in our sort of like deployed systems, that's how it works. So um, the, the sort of late launch is good for developers. I, in our use cases, we, we wouldn't want to deploy it that way. So um, I could see the, the boot logic still being useful, but certainly a K config option that would allow us to get rid of the scheduler um, would be useful. 
So at the moment, um, there's some broken kconfig logic that no one's ever got around to fixing um, that w won't be too hard to take out all the schedulers with. Yeah, so that would work. And once we had that, then we could uh, add, you know, kind of like what we need. There would probably want to be sort of some sort of K config option added to to add these additional hyper calls. Um, I wouldn't leave them turned on by default uh, because you know they're sort of adding additional capability that the existing schedulers would probably not know what to do with, um, and so. You know, having sort of this extra K config option to add the additional hyper calls that are needed would probably be a good idea. Yeah, that that's fine. We've got uh, we've got top level K config options for a number of subsystems. And then I'd probably do the same thing for building the driver, that kind of thing. Um, if the you know, you, you off by default, but if you turn it on, then it'll build the driver and um, sort of add the the logic for Zen into that as needed. Currently, the way Bearflank does that, by the way, is that it um, takes the the hypervisor binary and produces like a a blob that it can shove into the driver, and then from there the the driver moves that blob into memory and, and, and sort of executes it. At the moment, that relies on executable memory to do it. Um, that's a, that's something we're actually working now to remove. So that the only thing that would be needed would be like a, a write to CR3. But at the moment, it does require sort of like executable memory uh, so that you could put that blob into memory somewhere and then be able to execute it from a, an exit. And, uh, and so I'd be curious to see uh, how you guys would want to see that done. I know that when that one uh, kernel, or, you know, Linux kernel uh, thread was going about uh, split, um, the split lock detection, that uh, people started to freak when they found out that some hypervisors are using executable memory like us and VMware. And I don't know if they're going to want to allow us to do that moving forward, or if that's something you think they might try to remove and it, in in which case, you know, this approach from an upstream point of view might not be the best one. And instead, using the sort of move to CR three, where you write your own CR three and then jump back into the guest, um, is the might be the more appropriate path for Linux kernel in general. I mean, a lot of that will come down to exactly what upstream Linux want to uh, do with respect to their module handling. But one way or another they can't actually afford to break VMware. So one way or another, there is going to be a mechanism that works um, for hypervisors of this style. It may not be exactly the same as how it looks right now, but uh, there will be something that works. Yeah, I mean, I, it, the executable memory one is kind of interesting because I, I'm pretty sure that's how NVIDIA handles their stuff too to get around the GPL problem. So I'm not sure if they'd even be able to prevent that or not, but certainly the if the only thing is a move to CR3. Okay, so I, yeah. so I, um, it's a 4.30, so it's the, actually the next uh, yep. thing now, I think. So Brandon, uh, sorry, sorry, Ryan, do you want to finish up real quick? And then we can actually start, if, if we still have lots more to talk about, we can actually have another session later if you want to. I think most of the questions that I was looking for are answered. If there's any more questions for us, uh, we're, you know, if you go to our GitHub project, our Slack channel link is, is right up there. Um, feel free to join our Slack channel and, and jump on and ask as many questions as you want. Um, in the meantime, we'll be contacting you guys um, at some point to start working on integrating this stuff up into the Zen project. OK, great. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep, thank you guys.